Welcome back. We thought this would be a good time to have astronomer and St. Mary's University professor Rob Thacker in for a midsummer update, astrophysicist, uh, to find out what's happening in space, pretty broad. Uh, just to prove nothing can, can evade politics, so we're going to start on Earth. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And we're going to talk about NASA, which is facing some dramatic budget cut threats, yeah. as many departments are, uh, from the White House. And in terms of what you study, uh, this will have a tremendous impact. Yeah, this is really significant. When you look at the main sort of numbers for NASA, they're looking at about a 25% cut on their overall budget, but it's the cut to the science mission directorate. This is like 47%. And that's really significant. We've already seen layoffs, like some very, very good people that I know have been laid off in the States. And the implications for this, for science at NASA are huge. And I, and I know that we have the picture behind us from the James Webb Space Telescope, everyone knows about that. But we've got to remember that NASA is doing a lot more than space telescopes. It's actually looking down, doing climate monitoring as well. So there's an awful lot of stuff that's going to be impacted by this. And, you know, there's a lot of very upset people. And there's going to be a lot of people who are going to lose jobs as well. Now, some of those, uh, that, those, that expertise, yeah. those experts, could they be lured to Canada? We have a space agency. Do we have the resources for that? Are we interested? Universities? So certainly us. people have been talking about that. But the challenge is, I mean, the funding system in Canada for space science is very different to the US system. And uh, like a factor of 10 in terms of money doesn't even cover it. So we are looking at potentially people who are used to very large budgets coming to Canada and a different way of working. We scrimp and scrape. We do some really great stuff. Yeah. But in terms of our budgets, we're just not even remotely close, right? And, and that's a huge difference. I think many of these people will be looking at Europe, to be honest. Okay. And it's not the type of thing that, say, a Blue Origin or a SpaceX, I mean, we're talking a different field of of study so they may not be their skills may not be applicable well i mean for, for the people who who do the science i mean they have a very specific skill set the people who do the rocket technology development and things like that those people are in a different situation right now that's kind of like a hot area to be in i would say whereas the science side of thing has always been something that went on and on and on through nasa and now that's really under the microscope okay let's uh rise above sure. the politics way above <laughs> sure. and talk about some of, of this and what we've uh, been seeing uh, covered recently. Yep. And it's, I want to talk about one thing in particular and yep. get you to explain to us. 3i Atlas. Yep. Okay, what is this? It's been, there's been a lot of chatter about it. So this is the biggest, I'll call it interstellar comet that we've ever seen. So this is literally a comet that's coming from a planetary system outside of our own. How do we know that? It's going crazy fast. It's just got too high a velocity to have originated even from around our solar system. And so it's coming through. We've had two of these objects before, but what says 3 i Alice apart is it's that much bigger. It's several miles across by the looks of it. It's going to zip between the Mars and Earth orbit when it comes through, so it's going to be pretty close. And so we're now just starting to see a few of these things, and with the Rubin telescope that's just coming online in Ch Chile, we're going to find a lot more of these, we think, over the next months and years. Is it moving at such a speed that it will escape us or is is there enough time for folks like you to be able to study this <laughs> so we will be able to study it we will be able to take a few pictures of it that's for sure once it gets closer but it is zipping through i mean if you were to classify its speed relative to things in our solar system it's probably about three times faster than most of the things we see that are going fast within our solar system we saw a few images there of a uh, rubin telescope you yep. mentioned in chile this is the ferrari of telescopes this is going to revolutionize things right? yeah no this is completely different from what how James Webb works as a space telescope, for example. Rubin is about surveying the whole sky every three days. And so literally building a movie of the sky. And you're thinking, why is that interesting? Because it's going to open up what we call the entire field of transient astronomy. How the sky is changing on three days, weeks, months, and years, and so on. And we will have this totally amazing data set of the southern sky. So it will paint a complete picture of the sky every three nights. So, so the beautiful thing about it, yeah, it will do the southern sky because it's in Chile, but the beautiful thing about it is when they were proposing the telescope, they literally drew up the science area of resolution and time, and there was this big empty box with a question mark, and that was what Ruben was going to look at. And it was a beautiful way of getting people to invest. In We've stuff. been talking about this for a very long time. I think yeah. I did a story on it when I was yeah. a science reporter 
15, 20 years ago. Yeah, big telescopes take a long time to get built. As Canada, we were reviewing this in 2010. I was actually on a panel that was looking at joining the telescope in, a, in, a, in an official country capacity, and we didn't do that. Personally, I still feel that was a misstep. But yeah, it takes a long time to build a big facility. If it takes that long to build, do you, do you miss out on technology? Is it already dated when it's built? A little bit, yeah. That's especially true, believe it or not, for space telescope, because they actually have to be engineered to survive launch as well, which puts additional sort of like risk factors on the technology you can adopt. Whereas on the ground, you can tend to keep up with new things as detectors are improved, and you can always change them on the ground. That's the key thing. Rob Thacker, always fascinating. Thank you for coming by, and we will see you again soon. Always a lot of fun. All right. We will take a break. We've got lots more of your show after this.